Hi everyone, welcome to the Stringy Bark Festival. My name is Britt Josephs, I'm from the Knox Arts and Events team and I'll be online to help you throughout the session. Um, all of your cameras and microphones are turned off, so please put any questions you have in the chat bar. We do have a lot of questions already that were submitted prior to today, so we might not get to all of them, but we will do our best. So please send through those questions. Um, a recording from today's session will be available after the festival, so keep an eye on our Facebook for that. Um, our lead panellist today for your gardening questions is going to be Maria Chavarella from My Green Garden. And Maria will be joined by uh, Ella Boyan from Tooktopia and Angelo from, uh, sorry, Angelo Iliades from the Deep Green Permaculture. So just say a quick hello, Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks to Ella. Hi, Ella. Hi, thanks for coming. And Angelo. Hello, everyone. Glad you could make it today. Hopefully enjoy the um, whole session. Thank you. Fantastic. So let's learn how to make our gardens thrive. Over to you, Maria. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thanks to everyone for having submitted your questions already. That's given us a chance to uh, coordinate ourselves because we've got a heap of questions. But by all means, send more through. But you might find your questions will get answered as we go along. So let's just get right into it. So... So I say that. Okay, our first question, we're going to look at them in topic areas. So garden pests and problems is our first one. So how can I eliminate weeds, dandelion, other stubborn weeds from my garden? Ella? Thanks, Maria. So um, first of all, let's define a weed. A weed is considered to be a plant that's in the wrong place. Um, so what is a weed to one person might not be a weed to another. I have an ecological background, so to me, a weed is something that's displacing a native or a useful species. So a dandelion, I would tend to consider um, a beneficial plant and not a weed and actually use them to make dandelion tea or something like that. Um, although you can take an integrated approach to weeds and perhaps use a steak knife, you can just chop off the base of dandelions just under the soil level, drop off the taproot and give it a flip and that's done. No chemicals, no pesticides, um, a really nice way to do it without even disturbing your soil. So, um, so have a bit of a think about the stubborn weeds that you're looking at and, um, and how much of an issue they are. Obviously, there are things like English ivy, cooch grass, kakuyu. They get into your veggie patch, they decimate it. So, um, you know, getting in, again, natural things without pesticides. Um, I've had great success with ducks. And also just laying carpet over the um, whole area, solarising it, um, cutting off their light supply. Uh, that tends to be quite easy then to rip out the excess bit. I could spend three hours on this, but we have a lot to cover. So hoping that gives you a few tips just to think about an integrated approach and also just, you know, what, what actually is a weed and do you need to remove it? Thanks, Ella. Okay, possums, perennial problem. Over to you, Angelo. Oh, well, this is, a, this is one of my favourite ones because I've had to solve this problem twice, one at work at Bully Nut and Garden and one at home. The, um, the problem I find is that once they're displaced from their um, existing environments, like if there's construction or something going on next door, they will come to the next garden. They'll search for yours. If you make it difficult for them, they will avoid it. What I did at work, which stopped them, is I used a, my, my approach to pests is called integrated pest management. It's a scientific method where you combine different measures. Like one measure is like 10% effective, another one's 50% effective, another one's 80% effective. When you combine them, they work much better. Um, I, at work, because I couldn't put up electric fencing, which is what I did at home, some electric fences work brilliantly as long as they can't hop from tree to tree. But what I did at work is I used netting um, over the fruit. I used the fruit, um, the insect exclusion netting. It's two millimeter netting in drawstring bags. You put it over the fruit, they can't get to that. If they're chewing through drawstring bags, they're not birds, they're not possums, they're rats and mice. Um, the other thing is the set um, deterrence. What I did is I cut the tops of um, plastic drink bottles and put a wire through them put a little bit of cloth and tied it in there so the rain doesn't wash it away. And then I hung them up where they walk through. So I put um, some of the um, possum repellent spray into that and it worked really well. 
I had an avocado tree that they ring barked. So what I had to do with that is put a whole tree net over that. That seemed to work very, very well. And over the espaliers work, I put the insect netting over those and just fastened it with some clothes pegs at the side. The um, possum spikes do work, but the thorny devil variety, not the, um, not the bird spikes that you get with the little wire spikes. The, the plastic strips with... Um, they're not exactly spikes, they're just points. Um, you can press your hand fairly hard on them. They're just uncomfortable to walk on if you're a possum. I gave them to um, a colleague who put them over her roses and they stopped them quite effectively. So to summarize, netting, insect repellent sprays and um, boundary exclusions, i.e. spikes, barriers, boundaries, um, they all work. If the possum finds it discouraging, then they will usually go somewhere else. The other thing is you could also use decoy plants, um, put some, grow something else that grows really fast that's hard to kill off um, that they can eat instead. Um, Warrigal greens, Australian native plant, awesome plant, grows very well, very good to eat if you cook it and possums love it and they can't kill it. So there's four solutions there. Thanks very much, Angelo. Okay, um, back to Angelo again, this time slugs and snails and with this wetter weather we're having, they're out in plague proportions. Are there pet friendly ways to keep them in control? Yeah, um, my, oh, I'm a permaculture guy, which is essentially ecological garden design. And my um, teacher, Bill Mollison, who's one of the founders of the system said, you never have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. So if you've got ducks, you've got no problems with snails. That said, most of us in urban backyards don't have space for ducks, me included. So there's a few measures that are really, really simple. Uh, if you're going to um, go the avenue of pallets, um, don't use the blue or the green ones. They're, um, they're very, very, very toxic. Uh, so you can get iron-based ones. They're either elemental iron or iron sulfate or iron um, chelate. And things like multi-guard are a common one. They're iron-based, they're pet and child friendly. Just scatter a handful over a large area, they'll be okay. If you don't want to go that avenue, you can put, um, again, plastic bottles, soft drink bottles, chop the bottoms off, take the lids off, put them over your young seedlings. They act as a cloche. The English used to use glass bottles for that purpose with the bottoms cut out. You can just use plastic drink bottles, they will work. You can use barriers of coffee grounds. They absolutely hate the stuff. Um, also, if you spray with a strong es es espresso coffee, um, it's quite toxic to them. You can put barriers of eggshells, just crush them up really finely, spread them around your plants. They can't get through them. Uh, copper banding also works. If you get copper strip, um, you can put that around um, the legs of tables where you've got your seedlings on so they can't climb up there or around a um, plant or trunk of a tree that will work. The other um, easy way to get rid of snails is to catch them. Put a inverted garden um, terracotta pot with a little rock to prop it up um, overnight, then go in the morning and collect the snails out of them, do whatever you want with them. Uh, you can also get some rocks, put them down on the ground, put a plank of wood over, look under in the morning, you'll probably find a lot of snails and slugs under there. Um, so that, there's quite a few approaches. Some people use um, orange peels or oranges cut in half. That's too expensive for me. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Um, just any of those, either traps to catch them or the baits um, will work. It's Angelo. Lots of ideas there. And also you might find that your veggies uh, have jagged edges. Something's eating them. Thank yes, you. well, if you find holes in the middle um, of the leaves, they're usually snails because they've got little rasping um, tongues that can cut through the middle where caterpillars normally go on the edges. Sometimes if they've got lots of little holes, they'd be beetles, um, like potato beetles are normally quite common um, for leaving lots of little holes right through a leaf. And um, earwigs can also do that too. Um, so typically... If you've got caterpillars, the best prevention is to put insect netting over. What I do is put some little short pieces of bamboo into the garden and get a bit of irrigation pipe and stretch it over and then just throw some um, insect netting, two millimetre insect netting. It stops all the caterpillars and moths from getting in. Um, sorry, all the caterpillars from the moths and butterflies from getting in. Um, you can make earwig traps, use earwig traps for earwigs. Snail traps you could use potentially. Um, they're so-and-so, I didn't mention them earlier, because I've had mixed success with them and beers very... Um, some beers work, some beers don't. It's a bit messy to use. 
Um, the other thing you can do is you can spray with a spray. Um, it's, I think it was called Dye Power. I keep on changing names. Now I think it's called Yates um, Natural like Caterpillar Killer or something silly like that. It's a bacteria called um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural soil bacterium. You spray it on the leaves. Anything that eats the leaves, um, other than snails and slugs, um, will die after about three days. So there's a few solutions there. Lovely. Thanks, Angelo. Thank okay, my turn now. Best conditions for growing veggies. Are there any tips in general? I call it my triple S principle. Best conditions, you need good soil. You need amounts of sunshine and you also need to learn to grow with the seasons. So in terms of the soil, uh, vegetables don't need a terribly deep soil, but at least we need 25 to 30 centimetres of of growing space for their roots to go in and pick up all the nutrients that are in there. So a lovely, rich, loamy soil, friable. Now friable means that um, the roots can penetrate through as can water, but also it's got to be well drained so the roots aren't sitting in the water itself. Uh, in terms of sunshine, look, if you're growing vegetables that are going to put on fruit for you, such as tomatoes and eggplants, you need at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight for maximum production. Other, if you have got less than that, then you certainly can grow other things, um, but they tend to be green leafy vegetables. Look, don't stress if you don't get six to eight hours direct sunlight, you will still get, say, tomatoes, you just won't get as many because the plants need that sun uh, in order to photosynthesize and create um, sugars and carbohydrates and so on. So best conditions would be, uh, Again, great soil and soil amelioration is an ongoing thing. You don't start with great soil and it keeps being great. You've got to keep be doing things with it. And um, plenty of sunshine and learning to grow with the season. So it's no point trying to plant tomatoes in winter. Not the right season for it. So getting to understand uh, what, what's happening in every season is really important. Let me keep going. A lot of us have this issue, clay soil. Okay, yeah, well, I just did a huge article on um, how to test your soil types and how to um, figure out what type of clay soil you have in one of my articles on my website recently. Now, clay soils, any kind of soil can be improved with addition of compost, organic matter. With clay soils, the organic matter will get in between the clay particles and loosen it up. It'll make it more friable. In other words, the roots can penetrate through. If you've got sandy soils, it'll help with moisture retention. Now, some people use gypsum or clay break. And if you're going to amend your clay soil, by the way, I would normally just dig the compost in into about 30, 30 odd, 30, 40 centimetres, basically a spade depth. That's usually sufficient. I'm a no-dig gardener, so you could actually just put the organic matter on the top and mulch over it. The worms will do the work. Some people like to use gypsum, which is they, it's sold as clay breaker. Clay breaker, um, the gypsum clay breaker, it's essentially calcium sulfate plaster. So um, if you've got a sodium um, based clay or a so what we call a sodic clay, the way you test that is you get a little drop of a little piece of your clay, put it in a saucer of water and see if it spreads out and disperses and becomes cloudy and milky. If it does, you've got sodic clay and you can use gypsum. If the little lump of clay just sits there after 10 minutes, it means you've got a calcium-based clay and there's no point wasting your money on the gypsum. So just add the organic matter, keep on adding more and more organic matter, as Maria said, with your vegetable garden. The soil amendment is an ongoing process and eventually we'll have very rich, dark soil and the plants will be able to get their roots through it. But initially you need a large amount of organic matter. Uh, woody mulches, tend to create um, a more stable humus. So the black stuff in your soil will last a lot longer. If you use um, straw type materials, it'll break down quicker. It'll go into the soil, but the carbon will come back out much quicker. So make sure you incorporate some woody mulch. Don't dig the woody mulches in, use the woody mulches over the top and they'll eventually break down, create stable humus. And that eventually after about a year will probably create a really good soil. Okay, thanks Angela. So it is an ongoing process. Definitely. Now, a lot of us uh, have this issue now, small, only small areas, small backyards. I'm not one of those, which I'm lucky for, but I have issues because of lack of sunshine. So I have pockets of my garden uh, which get ample sunshine. So how can you maximise those small areas? Well, I like to actually look at 
well, what am I growing in there that will maximize production? So when my kids were little, I used to grow carrots, but only just for fun really, because it can take up a lot of space. And once you've pulled it out, that's it. Whereas I prefer to grow vegetables that are, what I could say, um, you, as you cut them, you still get more vegetables growing. So that's one way of maximising production. So they could be lots of vegetables coming up this time of the year. Uh, uh, tomatoes, uh, uh, cucumber, for example. Zucchini, um, you'd have to go for a bush style zucchini, not the climbing ones, uh, because they can take up a lot of space. And it depends on how many zucchini you really want to have. So really have a look at, what does your family or what do you like to eat? Don't dedicate a lot of space to vegetables that you're really not keen on, okay? Um, make sure, for example, if you're going to grow uh, vegetables that grow at different heights, make sure the taller growing vegetables are at the back of the patch. That means the south side of the patch so they don't shade uh, the other vegetables from sunshine that's coming over from the north or the west. Um, just make sure that, um, you know, if, if you've got fence space, for example, grow climbing plants that can, you can train to grow up a fence. For example, you can grow pumpkins up a fence if you provide some sort of mesh uh, for the pumpkins rather than grow across the ground, they can grow upwards instead. So have a look at different things. You might have eaves from which you can hang hanging baskets. So pots are another option and we'll look at pots a little bit more closely in the following slide. Okay, Angelo, um, some people often buy these sorts of raised beds and um, put potting mix often, more, than, more often than not, but they have problems with them. Can you yeah, well, I've them got, instead? Well, I've definitely helped with this one because I actually have a few growing tubs which are much smaller than those. But the good thing about most veggies is 80% of their roots are in the first 30 centimetres of soil. So a 40 centimetre bed is more than ample. The important thing is to fill it with a quality soil. Uh, if it's if you're going to fill it with, um, if it's over, if it's about to, somewhere around the 200 litre mark, if it's going to hold that, then you're probably better with a veggie mix. Uh, at work, we sell a veggie mix, which is a combination of a premium garden soil, uh, which has also cow manure, um, mushroom compost, manure. organic yeah. compost, um, all mixed in. And essentially, if you've got a mix which is, say, 50% soil, um, sorry, so about 50% soil, 25% compost, 25% manure, it'll be very, very rich because you need nutrients. The compost gives it the soil structure that's so nice and loose, makes the soil friable. The manure gives it the fertility. And you have to renew both of those, the compost and the manure, every six months at the end of the warm season, end of the cool season. So you fill it up with really, really bad soil, nothing is going to grow. Um, so you need to build soil structure with a compost and soil fertility. I like chicken manure because, sorry, cow manure because it's not that concentrated. Some people put too much chicken manure and burn all the roots. Um, and you don't use potting mix. Potting mix is up to about 100 litres, which say half wine barrel. Once you start getting into planters and beds, then you start using soil. Don't use soil in pots though because it just turns into a bucket of mud and everything will drown in that. So that's the important thing. So fertility is the key. And always, you, if you're going to use fertilizers in existing soil, don't use the liquid fertilizers. They're only a top-up or a supplement. You've got to put in a slow-release fertilizer, whether it's a manure or some kind of a powder, prill or pallet, and that will release over six months. And then you can top up with things like, you know, the power feed fertilizers. Don't... Some people make the mistake of saying, oh, of using sea salt. Sea salt is a plant tonic so you can that's full of potassium for fruiting and flowering so if you've got veggies of fruit and flower like you know, tomatoes and um, eggplants like maria was saying earlier that helps as a supplement but don't just use that go for a solid feed but start off right with a nicely composted nicely manured soil thanks angelo and i'm not going to repeat because you've just um answered this for me okay <laughs> loamy composted things with manure in it but the important thing is you've got to do this every six months you've got to top it up and this is where making your own compost is just a boon not just for the environment but for your back pocket as well so in my raised beds and in fact any of my garden beds in between planting i'm adding compost so every six months yes 
I do add a layer of compost, as much as I've got basically, which might, if you've got large gardens, might only be a layer that's five centimetres deep, but still you're renewing that, that soil. So you can't just fill it up once and expect to get great vegetables season after season after season. Okay, so back to me, what veggies can be grown in spring? And this is the time that people get so excited to be out in the garden because it's exciting in terms of the vegetables that you can grow. So the main um, crops that tend to be grown over summer are all pictured here. So we're looking, say for example, the Solanum family and tomatoes would have to be the number one crop that people are interested in. But part of that family is also eggplants too. And capsicum, chili and potatoes, they're all in there. Then there's the cucurbit family, so that's your zucchini, uh, pumpkin, cucumber, squash, they can all be grown over summer. And um, we're, then we've got things like uh, a sweet corn. Uh, I also love growing sunflowers, it's edible, but you know, don't necessarily look at them as being edible. Um, you know, the world is your oyster over spring in Melbourne, it is ideal. And of course, uh, leafy vegetables, if you want to continue to grow silver beet, that's fine. But not things like coriander, not things like spinach. Uh, snow peas are a bit touch and go over summer. Right now, they're great. So when we're saying growing in spring, you can grow them now, but you might not get great production. So um, October, November, we are preparing for the warm season that is coming ahead. So you can certainly be putting in things like lettuces right now, and they are growing in spring, um, but other things we're putting into harvest over summer. Um, carrots, parsnip, of course, there's heaps and heaps. So just some things that don't like summer is coriander in particular. A lot of people have problems with that. Well, now, which vegetables grow in the shade, especially in wet areas? Now, wet areas, I think, are going to be a bit of a problem this year because we don't seem to be getting many dry days in between the wet days. It's the La Nina that we're experiencing. But to grow vegetables in shade, a lot of your green leafy vegetables, so anything that we don't eat the fruit of, that we are concentrating on eating the leaves of, they tend to do okay in the shade in summertime. Not so much in winter, but in summertime, except for basil. Okay, basil we're eating the leaves of, but basil loves sunshine. It is a warm season plant. But otherwise, green leafy vegetables are fine in the shade and, and probably do even better in the shade over summer than they would um, than they would uh, in full sun. But wet areas are going to be a problem. So things aren't going to like having their roots sitting in uh, uh, beds that aren't draining well because soil is made up as much as soil as air pockets and those air pockets are where the roots need to go through. Now, if they, and they breathe in those air pockets as well. So if those air pockets are waterlogged because the water's not draining, you're drowning your plants too. So just got to be really careful with that. If it is the case, you may need to raise the garden beds a little bit to make sure that um, the plant's roots aren't just trying to cope with um, re really boggy soils. But yeah, you can grow vegetables in the shade, except you just won't have great success with the fruiting vegetables. Now, harvesting herbs, veggies and fruits, Angelo. That's a really big one. Um, I can just... Basically, some with the with herbs, essentially all herbs are usually picked just before they flower, uh, except for mint. Uh, mint, the um, oils, the aromatic oils are the strongest when it's actually flowering. But uh, that's, that's when I harvest my peppermint. But all the other um, herbs, you normally can just chop them. If they've got large leaves, you would take off the separate leaves and lay, lay them on a tray. Um, if, they, if they've got little leaves like rosemary and thyme, you just tie the springs up, sprigs up, and you can hang them somewhere in the kitchen or leave them on a tray with a paper towel underneath. Just put them in a spot where they're not um, getting direct light and it's not too hot because you, otherwise you lose all the active constituents. And it takes about a week to dry, I find. And then with the little leafed one, um, like thyme and rosemary, you can just grab the stem and just run your finger along, all the little leaves come off, and then you can just bottle them up in a jar. They last you for two years. Any of the um, root-based um, herbs, I like. I even grow my own turmeric. You slice them thin and put them on a um, greaseproof paper tray um, to dry. They take about a week as well. That works fine. Um, most harvesting, uh, well, harvesting veggies usually 
they when they reach maturity is when they're harvested some things like broccoli you can constantly cut the heads and they're repeat what M maria was alluding to earlier some of the um, veggies are repeat harvestable so even silver beet when it goes to seed um, you can chop the head off and then you can just keep on chopping leaves that works with most fruit usually they will either change color apples you put your hand underneath them and just give them a gentle pull they will drop into your hands things like berries you normally just give them a slight tug they will just yield basically nature gives them to you when they're ready to give them to you thanks angelo Okay, structures to be used for climbing plants. Now, this, this really is just limited to your imagination. So here's a lovely bamboo one all tied up there. But it really depends on what you are going to be climbing. So if they are very fine and um, the, 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 the plants that are growing aren't too heavy, such as beans or peas, they can be light bamboo structures that you can make either uh, in a two-dimensional format like this one or in uh, a TP format if you wanted to. Um, but if they are plants that uh, need a lot heavier or need more support for uh, branches that are holding fruit, and here where I'm thinking about tomatoes, you will need something a little bit sturdier than just um, very light bamboo. So really anything that you can tie up together and make it nice and secure. Uh, tomatoes is a classic case where you might just put one stake in and if you don't prune your tomatoes, diligently then you'll probably need, end up needing three or four stakes per tomato plant uh, so basically my answer is be imaginative see what you've got around the house even old bed frames you know make it really quirky if you wanted to okay setting up and using a greenhouse with veggie growing angelo okay i'll well, my experience is I actually helped a friend construct a greenhouse and he um, set up a hydroponic system inside to grow his tomatoes and um, cucumbers because that's basically all he ate. And the funny thing is, the great thing with that greenhouse is you can usually start, because normally uh, you talk about um, planting your veg, fruit and veggies, oh, sorry, your veggies seasonally. Well, the good thing about greenhouses is they can warm up a lot more. So you can start like a month earlier than what the garden calendars say um, is the time to start. And you can extend it to about two months later. So you can get it like an extra three months, almost like another whole season's worth um, of um, extended cropping. Now, the most important thing with a greenhouse, there's all different structures and styles of greenhouses. You can get the big, huge polytunnel ones. You can get the ones like pictured here, which are steel frames with um, plastic covers. You can also get ones with polycarbonate sheets of, uh, with aluminium frames. The most important thing with greenhouses is that they're situated in a spot that gets winter sun. Now, remember the winter sun is very low on the horizon um, in the north in the middle of the day. So you've got to make sure that whatever spot you choose to situate your greenhouse, it's going to get a lot of winter sun because that's what's going to warm it up. Because greenhouses, they're mainly for the cooler seasons when the sun's low in the horizon and the holidays that they warm up when it's colder outside. So you've got to pick that spot. You've got to look um, during winter, um, late autumn and even early spring and see where the sun is. That's where you're going to put that greenhouse in the hot weather. You don't care about the fact that it gets too hot because you open up all the doors. They have roof panels that open and some people put shade cloth over it. The old English used to actually whitewash them so they're reflective. So ideally, pick the right spot for it. You can either grow things in pots in the ground. You can grow things hydroponically. That also works. Some people will cut out sections if they've got a concrete slab underneath, or you just dig the soil and plant into that. All of those methods will work. But the most important thing is situating it so it gets north sun in winter. Thanks, Angelo. Okay, a quick one. How do you get heads to form on the cabbages? Ah, oh, this is an easy one. This was, well, this was an article I wrote two weeks ago on my website, strangely enough, because uh, my, my cabbage is just starting to form um, heads right now. If they don't get consistent watering, if they get too much heat or too much cold, they won't form heads. Uh, any, any adverse growing conditions. Also, if pests eat nip out the tips of them when they're um, little seedlings, they won't form heads at all. But the important thing is, Make sure they're watered regularly. Uh, also make sure they're not waterlogged. Make sure they don't get too hot and dry or they don't get stressed in any way. And you can just sit, then sit back and they will form heads. But essentially, it's only when they don't get um, adequate growing conditions that they will fail to form heads. And the other classic case is too much nitrogen fertilizer. It'll just force a lot of leaves and it'll stop that curling process. 
Other thing is not enough nutrition. So if you feed it every six months, it's okay. Don't overfeed. You can start feeding at the start of the season and feed every two weeks from, sorry, every two months from there, but don't overfeed. Once the leaves start curling, stop feeding because that will, that needs to stop being fed for the head to form. Um, okay. I'd ref- yeah. uh, if you're interested, I'd refer it to Angelo's website for more information there too. Thank and you. I'd refer you to my website. I'm just conscious of time. How can I grow great tomatoes? Oh my God, there's so many different <laughs> tips and tricks. Can I, just in the interest of time, invite you to go to My Green Garden. Uh, Our references will be at the end uh, and all my tips on growing fantastic tomatoes. Um, Hopefully you've got your seedlings already ready. They might be able to go into ground soon and then sort of stand back and watch them grow. Um, Taking care of mint. Uh, Well, geez, if you can't get mint to grow, something's really wrong because it's taken over in my garden. Essentially, they don't grow over winter. They prefer warmer area, warmer times, but they don't necessarily love really full sun. It's a water issue. And that's why mint used to be grown in pots under a leaky tap outside when we used to have leaky taps. Uh, They love that constant moisture without it being too boggy. But uh, take care of mint just by making sure if it's in a pot that it's kept consistently moist. And if it's in the ground, then you're probably trying to get rid of it instead. Uh, Good companion flowers for the veggie patch, Angelo. Ah, well, the ones that we got there are really good. Sweet alyssum on the left, that's an annual. It attracts all the beneficial insects like um, lacewings, hoverflies, ladybirds, and they'll eat all your pests. Um, the French marigolds that we've got pictured there are really good for um, getting rid of um, nematodes in the, in the soil. I would also, my, one of my favourites is calendula, big bright orange flowers, and they are, uh, what's it called? They attract beneficial insects. They're also edible flowers. Uh, one of the things that I've got, green nasturtiums, absolutely gorgeous. Um, they're a trap crop. What they'll do is they get all the aphids will attack them in preference to all your other plants. And um, they've also got edible flowers, so they take the damage and um, saves your garden. I also love to keep a little nettle patch because all the ladybirds lay their eggs there and you can't um, kill nettles. They all come up every year and they're also um, very mineral rich. And anything from the daisy family, um, it doesn't matter whether they're native daisies, ornamental daisies, um, any of the edible types, whether they're chamomile or whatever it is, all of that family works. Also the whole um, dill, parsley, carrot family, just to let some of those, including coriander, go to seed and they'll all attract a lot of beneficial insects and they'll also self-seed to give you your next season's crop. Okay, thank you. Successfully growing citrus. Now, there was um, a, a webinar just prior to ours, and so uh, you might also be able to go to the YouTube channel for Stringy Bark because that'll be up there. But, Angela, what are your top tips? Okay, like what you said about flowering and fruiting veggies, um, citrus need sun they need six to eight hours six to eight hours of sun minimum and because they're evergreen that they need to get that sun all year round so you look at the spot in the garden where you're going to get six to eight hours of sun all year round that's where you plant your citrus they're very shallow rooted and they don't like um, boggy soil so make sure you dig lots of compost in the soil so your soil is going to be well draining don't don't plant it in a gully where the water's going to gather on a slope would be okay um, raised beds are fine. Just make sure you improve your soil. You have to, they're heavy feeders, so you do have to feed in spring. So start feeding in September. And you can feed them just September and March twice a year if you want an absolute minimum feed. If you're a purist and you want to get the biggest crop, feed them every two months from September to March. Um, make sure if you get scale or aphids, um, just spray them with echo oil or, you know, like a white oil, a horticultural oil equivalent. And... Um, What's the other thing? And make sure you put a gall wasp trap and then they should be right. Thanks, Angelo. Can you grow citrus trees from cuttings? Unfortunately not. They're usually grown by air layering, uh, which involves skimming some of the bark, putting um, some peat moss around or sphagnum moss around it, wrapping it with plastic and leaving it for three months to root. The only catch is the roots of the citrus are... might not be adapted for clay soils. That's why they graft all our citrus, they're bud grafted, because they put them onto a rootstock which will tolerate our um, Australian soils and especially some of the Victorian clay soils. So it's all why it's always best to get a grafted citrus. 
Thank you, Angelo. Uh, how do you grow blueberries in the garden? Uh, very difficult, I think, straight in the soil, unless you live up in the hills. Uh, so you're looking for a pH, a really, really nutrient-rich soil, um, the compost rich, I suppose, with a pH of around four, four to five. So it's very, very acidic. So best to try and put them in pots, large pots, and um, pot it up with an azalea camellia mix because that's already formulated for acidic plants. So you'll have trouble in soils unless perhaps you live up in the hills, uh, Mount Dandenong area, which some of you might. Angelo. <laughs> Growing for joa, persons, apricots, figs, plums, basically fruit trees. Any tips? I grow all of these myself. The um, again, the light determines productivity. The more sun they get, the more productive they are. The fajoas, you can usually they're evergreens um, in that list. Um, they can be essentially put in really hot, dry spots. They're great as a windbreak. I hedge mine because you can make use them as an edible hedge. I take them with hedge clippers and they're really productive. Persimmons, um, you have to know how to prune your persimmons because you prune all the tips off the ends of the persimmon, you won't get any fruit. That's really important. So I've got a big guide on how to prune persimmons. Um, they will get into big trees. So it's ideally you want to keep them low, just like all the other trees listed there. A figs are absolutely tough they grow in very hot dry climates so if you've got a hot dry wind beaten spot the figs and the fajoas work perfectly there as do olives um, plums are tough as nails most plums just be aware that they need a pollinator so you'll have to buy two um, apricots figs persimmons and fajoas are self-fertile you just need one again same regime for all my fruit trees um, fertilize feed them in september um, mulch them in november keep them well watered through the season Give them a bit of seaweed um, extract because it's got the potassium because that's important for um, flowering and fruit retention and fruit formation. And then just keep the watering consistent until harvest time and make sure you prune them at the end of the season to keep them small. And that is pretty well a quick summary on how to look after fruit trees. Uh, I think we'll skip this one, Angela. Because yeah. I think well, we'll essentially... All the fruit trees that are sold at a garden nursery, like the one pictured here, are ideal for gardens. If you've got very little space, just grow for the dwarf trees. That should be sufficient. Thank you. Uh, and dwarf trees again for pots? Again, yes, definitely dwarf trees. Um, you can get, you can put full size um, lime, limes, Tahitian lime or kaffir limes, kumquats, um, the, um, and I think, and I think it's a my lemon into a um, regular pot, though. You don't need to go dwarf fruit stock for those, but they'll just get bigger. They get about two metres in size. Okay. Uh, strawberry leaves going white. It's a fungal issue. So an eco fungicide. And just make sure your growing conditions are suitable for strawberries. That is, they're not too, too plant, planted too close together and so on. Fungal issues often come because of lack of airflow. So look at that. But if you want to actually treat it, an eco fungicide would help. Uh, making your own potting mix, goodness me. Uh, yes, it's very difficult to because to buy a potting mix and knowing what you're getting because they're all so variable. Um, I think I've got information on this on my website. I'm just very conscious. We've got so many questions. Tips for growing veggies in pots. I'm just going to go to the next one. Uh, making sure your pot size is adequate because growing things in tiny little pots is very fraught with difficulty, except for perhaps one lettuce or something. And so if you're going to have a balcony full of um, medium sized black plastic pots, uh, it's going to be really difficult. Um, so good quality potting mixes in there, growing something that's suitable for the size that you're not overcrowding and making sure going back here, I like to grow in these vegetable pots, there's space at the bottom because they are called wicking beds, uh, because I'm a lazy waterer and this help when I forget to water because the water is in a reservoir at the base. Okay, Ella, over to you. Uh, recycling kitchen scraps, compost, worm farm, both, what would you recommend? Thank you very much. I recommend a combination. So depending on the types of organic waste you have and your garden, uh, a combination of at least two systems is really important. Now I'm conscious of the fact that we only have five minutes left, so I'm going to try to cover uh, a sort of holistic approach, uh, and then we'll give you a, a, a contact at the end. So uh, the, the different systems in a small garden, if you've got a lot of meat and that sort of thing, you can actually compost in what's called a bakashi bucket. 
which is a bucket twig um, it's got a ceramic powder in the plastic itself and the magic ingredient is um, activated uh, grain so this is a barley grain that's activated with fermented molasses so that's um, a really good way that you can ferment really hard to compost stuff like meat. Um, but then you can tip that straight into a compost bin if you don't want to dig a hole and bury it. Um, a lot of people will have a worm farm and a compost bin or a worm farm and a tumbler or a bakashi bin and a compost bin. So I definitely recommend having at least two systems. That way you can cover off all your organic waste and not just one or the other. Um, and then in addition to that, there's obviously the old school, you know, wrap it in newspaper, bury it in the garden, um, pop it in a layered bed as you're building up the bed. And of course, using chooks, which of course from Chookopia, that's one of my favourites. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what's suitable to compost, really anything organic can be composted. For ease, we tend to divide things into two categories, greens and browns, which also might be known as nitrogen rich and carbon rich, wet and dry. Um, they're really just a guide so that you know to put in a combination of both. If you were just to put in veggie scraps um, and fruit scraps that are really wet, and green, um, it's going to be quite slushy. If you're just to put in brown things that are dry and carbon rich like cardboard and bark, it's going to be really dry and really slow. So by having that combination, it's a bit like making a cake. You add your wet ingredients and your dry ingredients and you end up with a decent cake. You don't end up with dry, something dry and crumbly or something really mushy. Um, so eggshells is considered a brown ingredient. Absolutely put it into your compost. Um, I love in this picture, they're stacked in together. So if you stack your shells in together and pop that in your worm farm or your compost, the worms will actually come inside those and the baby worms will um, grow inside those. So think of it a bit like a creche or a nursery. And that's a really good way to um, protect your worms and uh, have them growing in your compost as well. To keep rats out, you can put in physical barriers like mesh under your compost bin. Certainly avoid putting in grains and things because they like to eat that and just make it unpleasant. The absolute golden tool for compost is a compost turner like this. You can grab this through Council's Compost Community Program. Um, there's a link at the end. Keep on turning that compost because who wants to sleep in a bed that someone's flipping the mattress every two seconds? And of course, get some water in there. No one wants to sleep in a wet bed either. So that's a really good way to deter rodents from your compost. Um, we've got one minute left. So how and when should I use finished compost? When it looks beautiful and crumbly and brown is when you should use it. This is actually from my worm farm. Um, this is nice and crumbly. It's not too muddy. You might find yours is a bit more muddy. That's okay. Um, just jump on the compost community website or look up compost on Knox Council's website uh, and follow the links and we'll give you all those tips as full tutorials. Um, and again, with Bernie cast, um, when it's looking, yeah, like quite kind of well composted horse manure. So it's brown, it's hopefully crumbly, but it might be muddy. Uh, and there's some great tips online on the website and on the Compost Community Facebook page on how to separate your worms out so that you're not throwing them in the garden as you're popping your compost in the garden. Keeping chickens, um, I know we have to finish now. So they have basic needs, not just for food, shelter, water, but psychologically they need their own kind. They need access to veterinary care. They need safety from pests and they need safety from predators. So again, I've popped up this fact sheet. If you jump on the Compost Community website, which links through from um, council, then you can uh, download a copy of that website or just get in touch with me directly and I will send out the fact sheet to you. I'll pop it up on the Compost Community Facebook page as well. Wonderful. So, thank, you. thank you so much, Ella. Just a quick question from Nilesh before we finish. Um, how many worms can we add to a compost bin? Personally, I would not add worms to a compost bin. It's a bit of a waste. Um, worms, if the compost bin conditions are right, worms will move in themselves. Um, but if the compost is working how it should, it's not the right uh, conditions for worms. It should be running really hot when worms don't like the heat. So don't add them. Um, let them come if they want to come, but they'll move on when it's working really well. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you. It sounds like we have answered Emma's question there as well. Um, so if that's all right with you, uh, panelists and Maria, we'll finish off there for today. We've just made it in time, which is fantastic. Um, and we've got everyone's contact details up on the screen, which is wonderful. Um, just a quick thank you very much to our panelists, Maria, Ella and Angelo. Um, it's been a wonderful session today. And thanks to all of you for attending and also for submitting your questions. Um, the Stringy Bark Festival will be live on Facebook until 9pm tonight on the Knox Arts and Events Facebook page. And our next workshop is at 3pm, which is Making Your Backyard and Balcony Buzz. Uh, the recording from today's session will be available after the festival, so keep an eye on our social media and website. And we hope you enjoyed this workshop brought to you by Knox Arts and Events. Please stay online for a one minute survey that will pop up on your screen. But goodbye for now and thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.